Hey guys, uh, tonight we'll um, start our study on the three terrors in the book of Revelation. This is Heavy Revy, uh, the series, and um, we'll go as long as my phone allows because the battery is getting awfully low. But we stopped at Revelation chapter 9 in our last study, and I don't even have time, nor do I desire to go into how my life has been lately, but I wanted to get this in um, before I um, just run out of time, and also I'm going to be going out of town. But in verse 1, it says, the now we've had... Real quick, the seventh seal has been broken, and then we have the four trumpets, and these were the woes, okay? And then in verse 13 of chapter 8, it says, Then I looked, and I heard a single angel cry, crying loudly as it flew through the air, Terror, terror, terror to all who belong to this world because of what will happen when the last three angels blow their trumpets. So now we're to the fifth trumpet, that brings the first terror. So we're into the, the terrors now, uh, and they're pretty uh, horrible, but not for us, obviously. Uh, so it says in chapter nine, verse one, then the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen to earth from the sky, and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. When he opened it, smoke poured out as though from a huge furnace, and the sunlight and air turned dark from the smoke. Then locusts came from the smoke and descended on the earth, and they were given power to sting like scorpions. They were told not to harm the grass or plants or trees, but only the people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were told not to kill them, but to torture them for five months with pain, like the pain of a scorpion. In those days, people seek death, but will not find it, and they will long to die, but death will flee from them. The locusts looked like horses prepared for battle. They had what looked like gold crowns on their heads, and their faces looked like human faces. They had hair like women's hair and teeth like the teeth of a lion. They wore armor made of iron, and their wings roared like, an, roared like an army of chariots rushing into battle. They had tails that stung like scorpions, and for five months they had the power to torment people. Their king is the angel from the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek, Apollyon, the destroyer. The first terror is past, but look, two more are coming. And so thank goodness this only lasts five months for those that are uh, being tormented. But this passage is reminiscent of Exodus. And you guys have heard me talk about the story of Exodus. It is a prophetic picture of our story one day where the end of this age is going to occur uh, and the Lord is going to return. And so before this, uh, the bowls, there is an attempt to get the people of the earth to repent. Now, anyone that took the mark of the beast, there is no repentance for them. The Bible makes that clear. But not everyone will take the mark of the beast. And so before he returns, he is trying to get people to repent. And so when you look at the Exodus story, you've got locusts that went after the vegetation and they were an annoyance. But here, you've got spiritual locusts or it could possibly be some type of military um, machinery. I don't know. I'm thinking they're spiritual just because of the language. But we also know that there's a lot in Revelation that is symbolic. So it, to me, it could go either way. But whether they are demonic beings or they are military machines, these are given authority. And so the star, if you go back and it says... I saw a star that had fallen to earth. So this is a, a past tense thing. This star, which stars often represent uh, 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 divine beings or fallen beings, what we would call angels. And the reason I don't use the term angel uh, is because an angel, that is actually a function. That is a word for messenger. Uh, Gabriel, uh, you, you know, you've got Michael, you've got other angels that are actually divine beings. Uh, you've got the living creatures, etc. And so there appears to be, uh, and we'll just go with the term angel. I just wanted to make that distinction. 
uh, that there is an angel that has already fallen, okay? And uh, I'm thinking, you know, obviously some type of past tense event. Was this uh, one of the main angels that fell with Lucifer with the third of the other uh, angels or stars? Again, the, the word star is used there. Uh, but regardless of where this uh, being comes from, it has authority to unlock the shaft uh, the shaft of the bottomless pit, and it's obviously tied to the demonic realm because it has already fallen, okay? So it's not a good angel. It's not a good being. It's one that has fallen, and now it has the key. The word shaft is, quote, a relatively deep pit or shaft in the ground, and then bottomless pit is abusos, and it means abyss, an extremely deep place, and it occurs only twice outside the book of Revelation. Uh, in Romans 10, 7, it refers to the abode of the dead, and then in Luke 8, 31, the prison destined for evil spirits. And so here in Revelation, we see that it's a prison in which evil uh, powers are confined and out of which they can be let loose at times. So it's not the lake of fire, nor is Satan regarded as being cast into this prison forever, but we do know from Revelation that he will be cast into this place for a thousand years, but not at this time. He's still uh, doing whatever it is that he does. Another term is called the underworld, and this is a co according to Zodiotis, the Complete Word Study Dictionary. We also have a definition of, quote, a location of the dead, in a place where the devil is kept, the abode of the beast as the Antichrist and of Abaddon as the angel of the underworld. Abyss, abode of evil spirits, very deep place. And this is from the Greek English lexicon of the New Testament. So basically, I guess you could say this is a part of hell or this might be hell itself. Now, the imprisonment or the prison, maybe it's located in hell. Somewhere this prison is located, okay? <laughs> And this fallen being has the key to unlock it, and the enemy will end up there for a thousand years. Now, continuing with the definition, it says it is a place of torment for sinners and fallen angels. From these definitions, it appears that the locusts represent beings that torment sinners and fallen angels in the abyss, and that these are going to be released on the earth as a preview that awaits unbelievers if they don't repent before it's too late. God is trying to get the last of the sinners saved, which is absolutely amazing. So basically what is happening is this angel is given authority to unlock the abyss, which is why I tend toward these being supernatural beings. But again, I wouldn't, you know, uh, discount any type of military weaponry, but I really do believe these are supernatural beings that that are released so that people can get a preview, a taste of what is to come if they don't repent and believe in Jesus Christ. And, and I'm going to develop that more in a second, their response. But we have in Luke 8, 30 through 31, where it says, Jesus asked him, what is your name? And he said, Legion because many demons had entered him and they begged him that he would would not command them to go into the abyss. So this is the same word. So obviously demonic beings do not want to be imprisoned and it would here and it wouldn't surprise me if this is where the spirits are referred to in um, Genesis I believe chapter 6 who slept with the women. Uh, that are now being held until the judgment day. It wouldn't surprise me that if that's the same place. So demons don't want to go there. I mean, it's obviously a terrible, terrible place that was not made for humans. In Matthew 25, 41, he will say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you curse into the everlasting fire prepared for the de devil and his angel angels. So the abyss isn't the lake of fire. It's a place of torment. But I think that we can definitely see that if the lake of fire wasn't made for humans, neither was the place of torment or hell made for humans. But humans choose to go there by not believing in Jesus Christ. Uh, we also have um, Luke 16, 20 through 22 through 24 that says, Finally, the poor man died and was carried by the angels to sit beside Abraham at the heavenly blanket. Blanket. 
banquet. The rich man also died and was buried, and he went to the place of the dead. There in torment, he saw Abraham in the far distance with Lazarus at his side. The rich man shouted, Father Abraham, have some pity. Send Lazarus over here to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. I am in anguish in these flames. And so, again, the torment that will happen to those who do not believe in Jesus Christ is very, very real. And that reality is going to show itself on earth in an attempt to get people to repent, to understand you do not want to go here. He doesn't want anybody to perish, but he will not violate free will. And so these locusts will sting like serpents. They're given that power. The word power is exousia. It's a very important Greek word. And it means they were given authority, legal jurisdiction, permission, or allowed to sting like scorpions. Uh, where it talks about how we've been given the power over all the power of the enemy. That word power in Luke, uh, I believe it's 1019, refers to us having legal jurisdiction. So we have exousia legal jurisdiction over all the supernatural demonic power of the enemy. That's what the next power means. And uh, and if you've ever been stung by a scorpion, it hurts. I mean, there's some scorpions in the world that their venom, venom, venom will actually sicken and weaken the body. And so these were told only to sting those not marked by God. They were only to sting people that could not touch grass, plants, or trees. Uh, and they were only allowed to attack sinners. They couldn't kill their victims. They could only torment them for five months. The word torture is B-A-S-A-N-I-Z-O, and I studied this one years ago. It's the idea of using torture to get a confession out of someone. So the original idea was the rack where your limbs would be stretched until someone would confess to their crime. Like if you ever watched the show Braveheart, they did it to him and he refused to admit to anything. Uh, so it's, it's an idea of getting someone to confess. Now, God is not doing the tormenting. The, the scorpions are. And... Um, it's also used to refer to the unforgiving uh, servant that was t turned over to the torturers. If you trace the word etym etymology down, you'll um, see that it, it refers to initially disease and mental health issues, and then it goes down to the word touchstone that's used to determine if a metal is real or not. But the root idea is being sick and diseased. And so again, he's... he's trying to, God is trying to get these people to see the, the lies they believe about him and or their eternal state. They're trying to make it, he's trying to make it very, very real. The torment will be so intense that people will seek death. And the word seek means to desire to have or experience something with the probable implication of making an attempt to realize one's desire. So what this means is that the torment from these beings are going to be so terrible for just five months. Imagine eternity in this state. But for five months, they'll try to commit suicide, but it will be impossible. So why would you try to commit suicide when you could literally just believe in Jesus Christ and be set free? Like, it doesn't make any sense. You know, and so it shows that God is just. You know, a lot of people are like, well, loving God wouldn't see anybody to hell. Actually... Love removes anything that offends it. He's not going to allow people who do not believe in the Son, Jesus Christ, to go to heaven. That would be like, why, why would we be born again if everybody gets to go? You have to be born from above in order to have his nature. That is the only thing that's going to get a person into heaven. And so when you have a situation where these people are tasting hell in advance... And instead of repenting, they're trying to commit suicide and actually have torment eternally versus believing in God. Then that shows how just God is. Only he knows the true condition of a heart. We may see the good that people decide to show us. We may see the mask that people try to show us. But he knows the heart. And I'm not saying that, well, he knows my heart. No, I'm saying he knows how wicked a person's heart is. And so 
If they refuse to repent or if they refuse to believe, then their future is sure. That's all there is to it. And so these people would rather seek death versus repenting. So these beings have a king, the angel from the bottomless pit. His name is Abaddon or uh, Apollyon, the destroyer. So king is, in the Greek, one who has absolute authority within a particular area and is able to convey this power and authority to successor. So the destroyer's, destroyer's authority is absolute in the abyss. He is the angel or the supernatural being that attends upon and serves as a messenger of a superior supernatural entity. So this tells me that this is probably not the enemy himself, the devil. This is actually one of his underlings. But he is the ruling angel in hell. So he serves Satan, but he is not Satan, is what I'm getting from the original language. But the key had to be given to this supernatural being to unlock the bottomless pit. In Revelation 1, 17 through 18, it says, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as if I were dead. But he laid his right hand on me and said, Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I died, but look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and the grave. So he is the one that holds the keys. Even Legion recognized that Jesus could send them to their place of torment before their time. So the authority, the key, has to come from the one who possesses it. So again, he's trying to get them to repent. So that's the first terror. Now let's look at the second. Then the, uh, verse 13, Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice speaking from the four horns of the gold altar that stands in the presence of God. And the voice said to the sixth angel who held the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great Euphrates River. Then the four angels who had been prepared for this hour and day and month and year were turned loose to kill one third of all the people on earth. I heard the size of their army, which was 200 million mounted troops, 200 million. And in my vision, I saw the horses and the riders sitting on them. The riders wore armor that was fiery red and dark blue and yellow. The horses had heads like lions and fire and smoke and burning sulfur billowed from their mouths. One third of all the people on earth were killed by these three plagues. So it tells us what this is. These are plagues. By the fire and smoke and burning sulfur that came from the mouths of the horses. Their power was in their mouths and in their tails. For their tails had heads like snakes with the power to injure people. But the people who did not die in these plagues still refused to repent of their evil deeds and return to God. They or turned to God. They continued to worship demons and idols made of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, idols that can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders or their witchcraft or their sexual immorality or their thefts. Okay. The four horned altar, we've seen this before. This is where the uh, martyred saints are at and they're interceding for God's justice. Uh, for the fact that they were uh, dead. And it's where the prayers of us, the saints that are on the earth, are mixed with incense that actually kicks off the um, final uh, end of the age um, uh, you know, tribulation. So Moses was instructed to make a four-horned altar uh, based on the blueprint of heaven for the tabernacle, and then later it was used in the temple. And this is where fugitives could go and they could cling for asylum. And there's also um, an, an, there is also an interesting story about an altar like this in 1 Kings 13, 1 through 6. It says, Behold, a man of God went from Judah to Bethel by the word of the Lord, and Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense, which, by the way, it was illegal for a king to do, but this was a false altar, a false religion set up in Samaria after Solomon's death. He cried out against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, behold, a child, Josiah by name, shall be born to the house of David on you. He shall sacrifice the priests of the high places who burn incense on you, and men's bones shall be burned on you. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Surely the altar shall split apart, and the ashes on it shall be poured out. 
So it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, he cried out against the altar in Bethel, that he stretched out his hand from the altar and said, Arrest him. Then his hand, which he stretched out toward him, withered, so they could not pull it back to himself. The altar also was split apart, and the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. Then the king answered and said to the man of God, Please entreat the favor of the Lord your God and pray for me that my hand may be restored to me. So he did that. But um, there was a confrontation between the dueling altars because you had the altar that was part of the tabernacle of David uh, in uh, Judah because after Solomon died, Rehoboam, his son, uh, had two kingdoms. The other 10 were snatched from him and given to Jeroboam, the king that's in this story. Uh, so that king set up a false religious system, altar, priests, etc., so that the people would stay loyal to him instead of go down into the territory of Judah and worship in Jerusalem. So there was this confrontation, like this altar is fake, and Josiah, a king that didn't come until 300 years later, is going to destroy and desecrate this altar. So here we see in the, the sixth terror, a confrontation between altars. So four angels were, quote, prepared for this hour and day and month and year, and they were turned loose to kill one third of the people on the earth because people are worshiping other gods and they're not repenting of their sins. The description of the horses and riders could, again, be a description of weaponry and arm, armies today, but I do believe and lean toward the fact that it's probably a supernatural army and that, of course, you know, a supernatural army can use uh, physical armies, of course, um, but the weapons are three plagues. Plague means to strike, stripe, blow, wound, or injure. So there's an illness and there is a wounding physically that kills one third uh, of the people. Now, what is sad is that in Isaiah 53, 5, it says he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. Pierced means wounded. Whipped means beaten. Both of these uh, things that he endured were meant to heal us from rebellion and any side effects of rebellion that cause sickness and disease. Now, I'm not saying that if you have a sickness you're fighting or a disease you're fighting, and hopefully you're fighting, not just accepting it, if you're a Christian, that you're in any rebellion. I don't know that. You know that. I don't. But the sickness and disease that entered the earth from rebellion, Jesus paid for us not to have it. So whether you are experiencing sickness and disease in your body from an actual rebellion or sin, or whether just the fact that sickness and disease are a result of rebelling against God in the garden, either way, he paid for you to be healed. And according to Peter, it's past tense. You already were healed. And I wish more Christians would understand that and talk in present tense as far as their healing. And then also in Isaiah 53, 4, it says, Yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. We thought his troubles were a punishment for God, a punishment for his own sins. The word weaknesses in the original language is literally disease and sickness. It denotes some kind of illness. And then the word carried means to take away. Sorrows refers to pain, suffering, and sorrow, including physically physical pain. So he became a man of physical, emotional, and mental pain so that we are set free from those things. He was loaded down with it and suffering and sorrow that comes with it so that we don't have to have it, so we don't have to carry it. Now, we might experience uh, persecution. If you're Donald Trump, you will experience that and prosecution. Getting ridiculous, by the way. Um, but the plagues that these uh, these beings carry are not able to touch unbelievers. And if you're wondering why, I mean, not able to touch believers. If you're wondering why believers are still on, you need to go way back to the very beginning of this series. But it's those who worship demons and idols, murderers, the sexually immoral, thieves, and those who practice witchcraft. These will be diseased, sick, and in pain, and their authority to punish is in their mouths and in their tails. Now, this is interesting. The word mouths is stoma. 
So it means mouth opening an edge. It is also that which comes from the mouth. Figuratively, it's edge or point as of a weapon, the figure being taken from the mouth as armed with teeth and biting, a sword and the point of the knife. So I would suggest that this is actually those that are being judged are being judged by their own words. Uh, so those that complain, those that um, say blasphemous things, those that use their mouth to worship other gods, their mouth is going to pay for it. In other words, they're going to be judged by their own words. And then the word snakes is snake or serpent. Now, the story that comes to my mind when I look at this is Numbers 21, 6 or 9. So the Lord sent poisonous snakes among the people, and many were bitten and died. Then the people came to Moses and cried out, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray the Lord to take away the snakes. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said, Make a replica of a poisonous snake and attach it to a pole. All who are bitten will live if they simply look at it. So Moses made a snake out of bronze, attached it to the pole, and one that was bitten, uh, and then looked at the bronze snake was healed. Now there's so much symbolism here, but the ungratefulness and the complaining is a work of the enemy. And then in Second uh, Timothy chapter 3, it says that they will be complainers, grumblers in the last days. And... Uh, and then the people were complaining about the manna, nothing to drink. So their words brought judgment of stinging, okay, um, of sickness in their body. And that's going to happen with the second terror. Uh, in John 3, 14 through 15, it says, As Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man will be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. Uh, I believe that somehow, and I could be wrong, but the sixth terror is related to medicine. Uh, in a book I read years ago, I learned that the snake that was wrapped on the staff uh, was to the Greek god that believed to be uh, that was believed to heal. So here's a quote from a website called sage-advices.com. What does the snake symbolize on symbolize on ambulances? The serpent and staff uh, in the symbol portray the staff of Asclepsi, Asclepius, an ancient Greek physician deified as a god of medicine. Overall, the staff represents medicine healing with a skin-shedding serpent being indicative of renewal. Now, here's another tidbit on this false god on the, theoi.com. This guy, or this god, was the god of medicine. He was also the patron god and reputed ancestor of Asclepiades, the ancient guild of doctors. Uh, he was the son of Apollon and Trachaean, Princess Coronis. His mother died in labor, and when she was laid out on the pyre, Apollon cut the unborn child from her womb. From this, Asclepios received his name, which means to cut open. He was raised by the centaur Chiron, who instructed him in the art of medicine. He grew so skilled in the craft that he was able to restore the dead to life. This was a crime against the natural order, so Zeus destroyed him with a thunderbolt. After his death, he was placed amongst the stars as a constellation, Ophiochus, I have no idea, the serpent holder. Some say his mother was also set in the heavens as uh, Corvus, the crow. Um, and his, you know, becoming a god happened during this time. He uh, was sometimes identified with Homer's Pion, the physician of the gods. He was depicted as a kindly bearded man holding a serpent entwined staff. And although he is largely absent from ancient Greek face painting, statues of the god are quite uh, common. Okay, now, why did I read that? Well, remember, so his name means to cut open. The word mouth that is referred to in the second terror means to cut open. So that's why I think there's some type of medicinal connection here. We know that the bronze serpent was later worshipped, I believe, by the tribe of Dan until it was destroyed. Um, and so here we have this god that is symbolized by the serpent around the staff on ambulances in the medical community. We have these beings that they're let loose uh, and 
it says that uh, uh, fire and smoke and burning sulfur billowed from their mouths. We know that that's three plagues, okay? And remember that the words, the word plague means to stripe, wound, injury. So there's some type of medical disaster or emergency of biblical proportions. And can I dare say trusting the science might be the worst thing that you can do. So we know that these beings are hellish due to the fire, smoke, and burning sulfur that comes from their mouths and the horses' mouths. But even with these plagues, the people would not die or did not die and still refused to repent. They worship demons and idols, meaning, quote, that they express by attitude and possibly by positions, want position one's allegiance to and regard uh, for his name. I also find it interesting uh, in 2022 that Davos prophet, just look up Davos prophet, said that the new God is science. So coronavirus really shifted things in a very interesting way um, in our earth. And I believe are preparing the way or is preparing the way for the things that we're going to see. Okay, so there's actually um, an interlude, like I talked about, a behind the scenes that occurs between this second terror and the third. And so we'll get to that uh, interlude uh, in the next lessons. But, um, you know, it's heavy revy. And so we can rest assured that we're not being tormented by these things. Um, but at the same time, it's going to be a little bit trippy. It's going to be a little bit trippy. And again, it shows that God is just because even with the preview of hell, even with three plagues that wipes out a third of the population of the earth, people still refuse to repent. He is just. He is good all of the time. He is love. He never ceases being love. But like I said at the beginning, love removes anything that offends it and rebuke is actually a mercy gift and he's not going to have his son die and buy all that he bought for us and then allow people who refuse to believe in in him into heaven that would not be love okay um that would be an open borders situation but don't even get me started on that especially these indictments a little bit ridiculous. I think I've said that once, I'm now saying it twice. Stupid is the word that I would use. And if you haven't watched my Quit Being Nice um, Urgent Education, I would highly recommend you do that. I have two podcasts where all my urgent educations and my teachings go. Um, the Urgent Education Anything Political is We the Deplorables. And then the um, teachings that I do is at Destination Church podcast. Um, I probably need to change the name of that, but for now, I'm just leaving it alone. Um, so you can get all of this and listen to it that way as well. So I hope you have a good evening. Please pray for me to have travel mercies tomorrow. Uh, and uh, God bless all of you guys.